Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. We have an outstanding interview today. We have two of the, the giants, the legends in the industry. We have uh, Dr. Adam Back and also Gavin Andreessen. Uh, Gavin, uh, welcome to the podcast, the two of you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so, I mean, obviously, um, Mr. Back's background, cited in the Bitcoin white paper, cited in the TORP uh, white paper, work for decades in the digital currency industry and then also the PhD in distributed systems. And then uh, Mr. Andreessen has been involved in Bitcoin uh, since the earliest days. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe you can talk a little bit about how Satoshi turned the project over to you in those early days and how nobody else was really working he, on stuff here. Satoshi tricked me. He uh, tricked you? He did. <laughs> He asked me if it'd be okay if my email address was on the Bitcoin.org homepage, and I said okay, and he put my email address there and took his away. <laughs> and so then suddenly I was the guy who everybody contacted about Bitcoin, uh, and then a, a few months later he actually stepped back uh, completely and disappeared. Oh, isn't that, isn't that interesting? <laughs> I don't know. Somebody take the alligator. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, it's great to have the two of you, uh, the, you know, absolute legends in our space. You've definitely earned your place in Bitcoin history. Uh, hopefully, Thamos uh, over at uh, the, the Bitcoin subreddit will let this interview <laughs> or discussion or whatever uh, see some, some traction. <laughs> Maybe you have something to say about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, communication uh, at the Amsterdam conference, I think it was last year, part of my... I talk about the state of Bitcoin. I said we need a better communication technology. Uh, you know, online discussions are often suffer from really poor quality. Uh, I, you know, any efforts to like, increase the quality of online discussions, I appreciate. I think Thamos screwed up. You know, he, he did the wrong thing in this particular case, trying to uh, trying to control the debate. And you you don't want to. I think the only dimension you want to control debate is to make sure that people are polite to each other, that they talk about ideas and not... Keep it professional. People keep it professional, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, you, I guess you can guide the debate, but, I mean, you can't control it. Right. You know, you try to control it, you're going to get this dry sand effect. Exactly. It's going to cause you, you're going to lose a ton of credibility because you're, yeah. So, anyways, here we are. Um, so let's... Uh, I, I guess we could get started with some science fiction, maybe talk about some snarks or something, <laughs> or we could just uh, jump right in. Um, we don't have a whiteboard, so I don't think we can talk about snarks. Oh, we can't talk about snarks. In podcasts, yeah. No. <laughs> they don't work in podcast format. They don't work in podcast format, no. <laughs> so, Gavin, you're, you've been kind of a big proponent of increasing the block size limit, and... You know, to, to just kind of start, with, I mean, we're talking about we currently have a box size limit of one megabyte. I mean, is that a lot? Is that a little um, in terms of size? Like, It's really little. So this is one megabyte every 10 minutes that needs to get propagated all across the Bitcoin network um, to all of the what we call full nodes, those that are validating every single transaction. And I mean, to put it in perspective, the average web page these days is two megabytes. So we're, you know, the limit right now is like half a web page every 10 minutes needs to get transmitted across the network. And that's just ridiculously small. Um, you know, I, I proposed initially 20 megabyte blocks, which would be, you know, two web pages a minute worth of transaction data, and there's overhead, and there's all sorts of others, you know. I'm waving my hands. You can't see it on a podcast. <laughs> um, that's what wizards do. <laughs> uh, and, 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 uh, 
you know, my la- the latest proposal, BIP 101, that I proposed uh, went down to eight megabyte blocks, which I think is is you know just kind of on a on a kind of on a on a if you look at the the network capacity of typical like home internet users, if you look at you know network capacity of nodes and data centers, you know, eight megabytes shouldn't be a problem for anybody anywhere in the world to still participate as a fully validating node, assuming they have a pretty reasonable internet connection. You know, you don't need a you don't need a super duper high fast gigabit Google Fiber uh, connection to keep up at that block size. And so I think that's a reasonable like place to start. And I think we should scale up as technology grows. Because, you know, we see announcements every week of 5G data on cell phones that's going to bring, you know, gigabit type bandwidth to these devices we have in our pockets that are now running with, you know, 32 or 64 gigabytes of memory and, and faster processors. So I've been around long enough to see that, you know, technology does advance, it does get faster. And I think we need to scale up uh, to follow those trends. So, well, how about how about that, Adam? Is is increasing the box size going to help increase scalability, or is it just going to increase the throughput? And and is it really comparable? You know, comparing a two megabyte website with this block that needs to be uh, distributed among a lot of different nodes. I mean, do you have any like? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yes. So uh, we we saw the uh, BIP sixty six Fourth uh, of July fork that happened uh, back on Fourth of July, and um, what happened? You know, it's uh, just just a, a protocol upgrade that everybody was happy to see deployed, and the network accidentally forked. And it turned out the reason for that is that. Um, Many of the miners were so-called SPV mining, or not, not validating the blocks. They were relying on other miners to validate the blocks. And the reason that it's expect, you know, assumed that they were doing that was to reduce their orphan rates and therefore their profitability. So the cost of actually transmitting the blocks, like the, the latency of transmitting the blocks during which there'd be a mining disadvantage and the validation time to check them, they can calculate to be enough that they were willing to take this risk. And now, people knew that there was a little bit of SPV mining going on, but it was only when this uh, soft fork deployed that they realized it's actually significantly in excess of 50%. So I, w- I think that shows that, you know, it's more the orphan rate and that kind of thing, for, at least from the mining side. I mean, there are two sides to uh, the overhead. One, one side is the miners. Um, they have to run full nodes to do mining, and apparently they're cutting corners because of the block transfer time and the validation time. And I mean, it's it's also a broadcast network, so you're really talking about sort of the time to broadcast this all through the network. You want the ratio between the block propagation time and the block creation interval to be reasonably high so that the percentage of orphans is quite low because orphans are expensive for miners. Um, so the other thing uh, Gavin was talking there about... Uh, the rate of data growth. So apparently, there's some data that shows that the, you know, data is still um, increasing, obviously, but the rate of increase is slowing, and the kind of dollars per megabytes. So you, you can, we're paying more for our bandwidth these days. Like our bandwidth bill per month may be higher. We can buy more, and it's possible to buy bigger plans, relatively speaking, in terms of, you know, fifty uh, percent above or hundred percent above the median or something. But um, there is some kind of S-curve going on. So it's not necessarily that this is going to increase exponentially. Um, uh, so the other, the other data point we were just talking about this a minute ago is the Bit Theory paper. They, they've made some claims, and you know, I guess we'll maybe hear some more about that during the workshop, um, that already at 2 megabytes, they think that 40% of the nodes will... Uh, drop off the network for a presumably bandwidth cap or bandwidth transfer limits and 95% at 8 megabytes. And I know the, you know, the Chinese miners, when they, as far as I understand it, when they put out their 8 megabyte suggestion, I think that was the kind of, you know, maximum limit that they felt they could support, whereas BIP101 proposes to use it as a starting point and go upwards from there. So 
my personal preference for a kind of compromise block size increase strategy for the short term is to start at two megabytes, so like a two four eight. So start at two megabytes and greater four megabytes over two years and eight megabytes over a total of four years. And then we can reevaluate how a bunch of stuff has played out in terms of, you know, what's bandwidth doing, what's the decentralization health of the network at that point, and how have uh, scaling technologies like Lightning and other, tra- other things and extensibility frameworks, how have they played out in practice? You know, we think they will work well, but we should uh, see them in action before we make scaling decisions based on them. Um, so I think it's, 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 you know, it's going to be more conservative and easier to agree if we have a shorter time frame within which the projections are happening. So you know, with BIP 101, it increases for 20 years, and I think BIP 103 by uh, uh, Pisa Rula increases for uh, 35 years or something longer, but at a lower exponential growth rate. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we let's see, Gavin. Uh, what two, three years ago, we were at the San Jose conference uh, together. Yeah. <laughs> How in the world has Bitcoin changed since then? Um, and and if you know, if we're if we're looking at how fast Bitcoin mutates and changes, then I mean, why why would we want to be planning out a block size increase over like a twenty year period? Oh, I mean, I- are are there going to be advantages to that, or it, or is there like some merit to this more slow and measured approach to increasing the block size? I mean, I like uh, predictability. That's one of the things that drew me to Bitcoin, is the rules are very predictable. We know how many Bitcoins are going to be issued 50 years from now. Uh, and we know how many Bitcoins are going to be issued all the way up through, you know, like the year 2140. Um, and so when I proposed a, a 20-year time frame for BIP 101 to scale up, you know, I, I looked at kind of the predictions for Moore's Law, kind of the predictions for um, you know, bandwidth increases, and it looked like the experts were saying, you know, we've got 20 years that the roadmap looks pretty clear. Beyond that, it gets really, really fuzzy. Um, I mean, maybe Adam's right. Maybe the only proposal that can get consensus would be something shorter term. Um, I mean, the good news for Adam's 248 proposal is is I know the lines of code I need to change in BIP 101 to make that happen. <laughs> so the code's already written. <laughs> um, and it would actually just drop right in quite nicely. Just need to change some constants. Um, you know, I'm going to be listening a lot at this conference, uh, at this workshop, to see what other people think. Right? I don't think it's up to Adam and I to decide oh, yeah. what and, the right answer is. And I mean, um, this... This conference has some really big names, you know, and who've had substantial impacts on yeah. de- de- decentralized systems and, and other things. Uh, we've got Bram Cohen, who invented the BitTorrent protocol, which has similar uh, issues yeah, I mean, I that, that Bitcoin does. Bram, because I mean, typical. I wonder if he has any statistics on like the typical BitTorrent user and what their connection looks like. The typical BitTorrent user is probably a lot like the current typical kind of you know, Bitcoin full node user. Um, you know what? What do you what do you think about that, Adam? In terms of like the what what node like what are like how many fully validating nodes versus SVB needed nodes are there? What what is this typical Bitcoin user that we've got, and is it really Necessary for us to have a single implementation of the software or the consensus code in order to serve that user, or should we have multiple different Im- implementations of of the consensus code? Um, well, the last part first. I think it's more conservative, at least right now, to have uh, one kind of consensus implementation. I mean, Bitcoin is basically defined by the consensus C plus plus code. Um, and that's that's why there's this work ongoing to package that up into lib consensus, so that you know if, if somebody wants to write uh, a Bitcoin daemon tuned for different purposes or in different languages, um, they can link to this library and then be guaranteed, closer to guaranteed, 
uh, bit for bit consistency. You know, we've we've seen cases where even Bitcoin D has conflicted with different versions of itself, so it's already high enough risk without you know re-implementing it. The consensus part of it in other languages, but that's that's more of a micro level detail. Um, so yeah, but isn't I mean. We have lots of different species of life on the earth. It's that diversity of life that makes it so anti-fragile and really gives it a lot of its ability to uh, survive and thrive despite lots of different cat- catastrophic risks that can come in there. I mean, what, what do you think about that, Gavin? It, yeah, actually, different implementations. I, I mean, there already are some out there. There are. I've actually been playing with uh, conformal. It's uh, BTCD, but I think Conform will just change their name, um, uh, which is an re-implementation of Bitcoin in Go, um, the Go language, um, and it's pretty good. You know, I don't know if it's 100% consensus correct. I do know they found some consensus kind of edge cases that we weren't testing for in Bitcoin Core before, and we are now because they contributed patches. So that, you know, we're looking for those edge cases and making sure that as we change Bitcoin Core, we don't accidentally trigger one of those edge cases that, that, that causes core to become inconsistent with itself. Um, and I mean, the very fact that we've had a couple incidences where core was inconsistent with itself and we did have blockchain forks. So uh, what would be an example? BIP66? BIP66 was a, a fix that we had to keep quiet. It was um, this weirdness in open SSL that caused, could have caused systems running on 32-bit machines to disagree with systems running on 64-bit machines, running identical software. So the 32-bit machines would reject some valid, some transactions that the 64-bit machines would accept because of tiny little detail in the OpenSSL implementation. Um, so that's, a, that's, that's actually a pretty good example. Um, BIP66 fixed that. Um, and Peter Vola is a brilliant and, and found it because he's a very careful engineer um, and was doing work on, uh, you know, replacing the open SSL signature validation with his libsecp256 uh, library. Um, and so I think with careful engineering, you can find these issues, you can kind of flush them from the system, and we've been doing that over the years. Um, and at this point, I don't think there are a whole lot more of those left to be found, right? The, the code that we see uh, has been explored multiple times by multiple implementations by lots and lots of people. Uh, you know, we're finding like really like edge case bugs in the open SSL implementation, which we're flushing out of the system. So I am three years ago, I think I would have agreed with Adam that like it was much too risky to, to have more than one implementation today. I think the risks are manageable, right? I mean, the core has forked itself. It got fixed. Um, and Dr. Woolley seems to be Superman in a lot of these cases. He is. Yeah, no, Peter's fantastic. Um, what, about, what about this decentralized nature of writing the software then? You know, having multiple reviewers, having multiple committers. I mean, do we as an industry really have those resources today? Um, or are we, are we growing up enough to kind of implement this vision that would make us more resilient? Or, or we assume it would make us more resilient. Um, I don't know. It's hard. It's it's hard to 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 get up the learning curve to really understand all the issues of consensus well enough to be like a really good reviewer, to be a really good, um, you know, I, I want to say penetration tester, but that's not the right word. You know, somebody who 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 uh, you know, can look at the code, can kind of see issues that might exist there that might break consensus. Um, we do have those people. Uh, code review continues to be a huge bottleneck for, for innovating with Bitcoin Core. I think that's one of the reasons why I would like to see more experimentation with other implementations, frankly, uh, so that you know, a person maybe who's an expert in Go uh, can you know look at the Go implementation and make sure you know find edge cases there. Um, and you know, having one code base, I think, is becoming a, a, a bottleneck uh, for, for innovation and for experimentation. Um, I mean, maybe libconsensus will help fix this. 
yeah. if lib consensus ever gets done and there's this reusable library that's rarely touched. Um, I don't know. We'll see. So I wanted to say something about the uh, complexity of keeping two re-implementations of a network protocol um, you know, bitwise perfect. So you know, we've had a reasonably good time so far because people have, I think, kind of held back the, peop the people that would normally attack network protocols like Bitcoin and they don't want to damage it. But if we, if we got some focused attacks and the kind of zero days that get developed and sold to the NSA or sold to the highest bidder or used by black hats and kept secretively until they get released, I think these kind of um, you know, bitwise inconsistencies can be exploited to steal money from people who transact bitcoins quickly. So some companies are, you know, they're doing zero confirms or one confirms and they're bridging the difference. And so for them, they could lose money. And just to talk about the complexity of it, so there's this really interesting paper by uh, Dr. Meredith Patterson, which is um, talking about programming language for, from a formal language point of view. And so she, she reaches actually some conclusions about the types of messages you should write on the protocol because the messages between a distributed system are like a form of language. Like the messages that Bitcoin sends on the network, they're a language. And so it's not talking about the language that you implement the nodes in, but the language of the communications in the network. And what she says is that um, to it's, it's a whole exploration of language security and basically what she's saying is this is like NP complete. It's, it's a lot more complicated than people anticipate it would be. And so this is partly an explanation of why uh, software keeps getting exploited over the network. It's just much harder than we thought it would be. But the interesting, you know, there are conclusions in the paper which are, you know, guidelines on what not to do, which aspects of the message, the types of messages, the fact that they're, you know, maybe unbounded or not fully testable, not systematically testable because they're the type of the language. You know, there may be concrete things we could take away from that paper to improve Bitcoin's protocol, but I think that means that it's, you know, it's potentially complicated and risky. So, I, I think you know the short term is to to use lib consensus is my preference. Um, so I wanted to. Did, did yeah, you have a response to that? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think part of it also is just to keep it simple, stupid. Uh, yeah, well, that's and that's one of the arguments with like. The, the, the block size is working right now. And I was actually talking to Dr. Timo Henke. He has a PhD in cryptography, been involved with Bitcoin for a long time, yesterday at the consensus uh, conference. And he said, well, I think the burden of proof should be on the people that want to keep this limit uh, on the block size. Um, I mean, what, what do you think about that? Does the limit, is, would, that, would, would that kind of jive with what you want to do? Or, or would that even not necessarily in my heart be functional hearts, and work? I think everything would be just fine if the limit was completely eliminated. I think actually nothing bad would happen. I'm not convinced of that enough. I can't prove that uh, enough to, to actually propose doing that. And then there are practical issues. Of well, well doesn't, the, doesn't the limit act for some existing limits that prevent different attacks? There are. I mean, you certainly there are like out-of-memory attacks that you could pull off if the block message was unlimited and you could just stream a petabyte of data to a node to make it fill up memory or disk. Um, so, so, so I guess we'd have to fix some of those things first before we just eliminated the block size absolutely, you would. in and total. It, you know, it, there, there's engineering things you could do to fix that, but then you start getting into it's not keep it simple stupid anymore, right? I mean, having a, having, having a limit that you know about is kind of the simplest thing you could possibly do to, to prevent these, to, reason, to help reason about possible attacks and to you know, test, right, at the limit. Um, you know, it's a very simple, understandable, it's very much in the keep it simple stupid. And, and we've actually, from a lot of these stress tests that have happened uh, over the last few months, we've actually seen a lot of uh, it's fair to that a lot of problems that have gotten solved, whether it's the SPV mining issue, whether it's uh, some of our SPV wallets, whether it's uh, not having transaction fees being included in some of the wallet implementations that are out there. I mean, a lot of these, you know, it's helped flush out and fared out some of these these problems and, and we're better off for it. It has. I mean, I think, uh, I think you know, Bitcoin Core has, has sailed through the 
the so-called stress tests with flying colors. Um, you know, we have had, I think in the latest stress test, there may have been some uh, kind of very low memory nodes whose memory pools filled up and they crashed and probably got automatically restarted. So it's not that huge an issue. Um, I think we have seen more like wallets, wallet implementations that need work, that need to either be able to handle a higher transaction volume or need to respond with higher transaction fees if, uh, you know, if there's some pressure uh, in the network. Well, what, I mean, what do you, what do you think about this, uh, Adam? I mean, are there, are there potential threats that, because you proposed this kind of 248, uh, I mean, are there, are there specific threats at 20 megabytes that would not be present at 2 megabytes? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, just just in the terms of, um, you know, the you can look at the average uh, validation time of a block or the average memory consumption of a block, and there are some limits in the code, in the consensus code, about what constitutes a valid block to provide resource limits or accounting for signatures and so on. But some of those are imperfect. Like some of the logic is slightly wrong, and people have ideas about how to improve that. So I think Mark... Back is going to talk about that on um, one of the sessions over the next few days. But um, it, it would be possible to create a kind of a worst case CPU or worst case uh, you know, validation time. You know, so if you could make a block that takes an hour to validate, that could be pretty dangerous. Like maybe the guy who created it could just keep creating blocks until people decided to block him somehow if they could. Um, but you know, that that's why. You know, I mean, so BIP 101, actually not in the BIP yet, but in the implementation there are some limits and other people have proposed, you know, other limits or other ways to account for the resources more correctly and to fix some kind of DOS bugs and also, you know, the efficiency, some, some of the format decisions make it difficult to process things efficiently. So some of those things could be fixed uh, midterm. Um, so I think um, the other thing we were talking about just a little bit ago was the uh, full nodes ratio. So you know we have we have miners with full nodes, and so one can say something about okay, miners could maybe get better bandwidth. I mean, apparently the Chinese miners think that eight megabytes is a kind of hard limit for them, and I think BitFury has come out to say that they would prefer not to have more than two megabytes right now. Uh, I presume that's because of their location. Or what, you know, they go where the power is cheap, not necessarily where the bandwidth is available. But in any case, you know, there's more scope for somebody with tens or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of ASIC equipment to do something pretty adventurous in terms of you know, bidirectional satellite. I mean, money can buy bandwidth in some cases. Um, but the other the other side of uh, running a full node is people who are running a full node to be uh, to rely on it economically. So this concept that the so Peter Waller um, put this concept to me, which is that the full nodes that people run that they rely on, so the economically dependent full nodes that power users would run, that Bitcoin merchants and hosted boards would run, um, are actually the entities that enforce the consensus rules in the network. So it's, it's they that set the, the consensus rules in the network, and that kind of balances what miners can do. So if there were no full nodes in the network, take you know, sometimes when you want to explore the, the kind of pattern or replication of things, you take it to the extreme case and see what happens. So if there were no full nodes in the network run by users, everybody would be SPV dependent on miners, and miners could more easily get away with you know, types of forgery, or they could group together and in, in, uh, create types of forgery, and also there'd be an enhanced policy risk because you know, there are the miners, mining is quite centralized right now, so policy could be more easily applied to miners. I mean, you know, right now to get over 50%, it wouldn't take too many kind of uh, court orders or something to ask them to do something. That's well, better than it was like a year or two ago. Yeah, didn't like Discus Fish or someone have like 55% yeah. or something? I think G-hash.io. <laughs> or G-hash, whoever it was. 50. It probably actually wasn't at over 50, but just because it's statistical variation. But I mean, it, you like, is, but if somebody Before control... That deep uh, bit was getting yeah. up in the 40s. But still, and, I mean, if somebody controls lots of hash power, they could just point it to several different pools and, yeah, and they then decide, it. oh, well, you know, that, I that, guess... That's, that's kind of the funny thing, right? We can kind of see where the hash power is. 
You know, so, in, the, in the ideal distributed world, it would all be dark. We would have no idea who had how much so cash power. It's actually a feature in a way that we can because we have some approximation of how right. bad it is. Yes. I mean, they could certainly hide that. And it may be that some of the people who got to 50% ranges chose to hide it rather than lose hash rate. We, we won't necessarily know because there's often this kind of unallocated segment in the pie charts of well, there's also, doing that. There's also the incentive to attack a pool rather than mining yourself. Mm-hmm. With, uh, block withholding attacks, which is interesting, yep. and I noticed that the the it seemed like the the era of the thirty percent mining pool, thirty percent public mining pool went away around the time that those papers were published, <laughs> where it was pointed out that if you take some of your hashing power and you do a block withholding attack against the biggest pool, you so, actually. So do you think they went away, or just that they split their pool in two halves and got allocated a different IP address? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Anyway, I mean, what, I mean, oh, go ahead. So I was going to say, I mean, it's, it seems like, so Mark Friedenberg wrote this kind of summary of his views of the status of decentralization of Bitcoin. It's on Reddit and it received, I don't know, like 140 upvotes. So apparently it struck a chord with a bunch of people. And which is just to say that Bitcoin decentralization is really kind of weak right now. I mean, you've got, you know, uh, big pools. There's, a, there's more kind of vertically integrated mining. There are a number of miners that went bankrupt. And there are fewer suppliers of equipment that end users can buy, and you know there's there's already the existing kind of. Well, which which pieces of that do you think the the block size makes an impact on? We talked about yep. full nodes that people run that right. that measure decentralization. Certainly, if the block size got high enough, we're not really sure how high. It, you know, yeah. So, so my point is is kind of second order or so, which is that. So you have uh, economically dependent full nodes, and it's harder for them to um, work with increases in block size because they're consumers and they're not getting paid. Some of them are consumers, or they're small businesses or startups or what have you. And miners have a revenue stream that can support supporting increased bandwidth. And so the idea is that you know you've got two forms of decentralization here. So if the mining ecosystem was very decentralized, kind of going back years ago when it was like CPU or GPU mind. Yeah. If it was that level of decentralized, we would, I think as an ecosystem, the technical people would be more happy to yeah, jump the block size up to 16 megs or something because there's lots of decentralization. And so if, if the mining side of things is quite centralized, then it's more important to hold on to the full node decentralization like because they're checks and balances. So mining is already too centralized. So, and full node centralization is also slipping a bit, a bit in the sense there are more people, you know, there are less full nodes than before. We don't know exactly how many of them are economically dependent because you know, people can run full nodes that are not doing anything. They're just providing service to SPB clients and there's a huge excess capacity of that. You know, the SPB clients are not using that many resources. So it's hard to get a picture of it, but there seems to be a pattern of you know, more people outsourcing um, yeah, I see that. Notes. I see that as a natural evolution as Bitcoin kind of goes professional, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you look at other industries, things tend to be very highly vertically integrated, and then they get more and more specialized with you know different people taking pieces of the industry. And so, you know, the idea that even big companies are are outsourcing the running of a Bitcoin full node, it, yeah, I would have predicted that. Just as kind of normal due course, right? in, in which they're doing. I mean, Chain.com just sure. raised thirty million. We've yeah. got we've got quite a few like Jim Armory, a lot of these players. Well, uh, if, if your that's core, the type of service they do. Right? If your core business is not right, is using the blockchain, is not you know, is not uh, is not you know, managing a full node. Is is not you know, that's not part of your core business, right? You just want to use the damn thing. Right. Um, I and mean, I, we see the same thing with wallets and end users, right? I, I run SPV wallets on my phone. I'm not going to run a full node on my phone for a lot of reasons. Um, even if. What if there was a 100, meg, 100 kilobyte block size? Then you could run I still wouldn't phone. run it on my phone. Right? No. I mean, it's just more convenient to. Uh, to and, and I'm willing to do that security trade off of running SPV mode because most of the people I trade with I actually trust. <laughs> you know, I trust that they're not going to double spend me. So, so you I, don't I, actually need to do the validation of the transactions. But, I mean, we need 
I mean, that, but that gets to the heart of what Bitcoin is, isn't it? Like people holding their own private keys and people being able to do their own validation. If they want to, right? I mean, it should always be possible for you to opt in to kind of audit the entire system from, you know, beginning of time. Uh, but I guess part of it's also this trade-off between, I mean, like me personally, I, I use Armory. I use Bread Wallet. I use Copay. Yeah. Like I use Airbits. I got I got a different bunch of wallets different... for different situations. Well, yeah, and like it, okay, so say my Airbits wallet were to get compromised, well, okay, I might lose fifty dollars in that, but I, I got my fifty dollars in Copay and fifty dollars in my Bread Wallet, right? But they're all on my iPhone instead of having the whole hundred and fifty dollars on one wallet. You know, I, I figure it's kind of your your opinion on having multiple implementations well okay there might be a bug in one or two of these other ones and so by having having you yeah. know, distributed out the risk a little bit with part of this helps. debate I think I mean I may be being unfair to the other side I think part of this debate is is I don't know what I'll call the uber geek who, who has the opinion you know you should want this <laughs> right you should want this ultimate security um, and I don't I don't see things that way. I think people should have a choice, and, and I see it as a trade-off. I mean, there, there are always trade-offs with security. Uh, but it, is it possible to build what we want to build with Bitcoin if we – don't we have to have the ultimate in terms of security as a foundation and we can, we can decrease our use cases – uh, as we as we move out from that, but if we if we somehow Who, erode, well, who's who's we? <laughs> well, any type of user. So, like in, in my case, I would be using Armory for certain types of transactions, and I would be and I use Bread Wallet or Copay or Airbits and other types of transactions. Uh, is there is there this need to kind of? I mean, obviously, if we can move the the economic calculation for how much security somebody's willing to buy to the individuals and have multiple different implementations that they can choose from, that should help figure out like how much of the security needs to be purchased. But at the very core of Bitcoin, like if we don't have the most secure blockchain or or decentralized blockchain or whatnot, doesn't that kind of impinge on some of the overall value proposition for what Bitcoin's offering? Oh, yeah. I agree. Um, no, I mean, Mike Hearn has interesting thoughts on how much blockchain security do we need? Will there be? Um, and I mean, the fact that you know there has, in the history of Bitcoin, basically never been a successful double spend that might indicate that we're over secure. And and I would not be. I mean, how many? Mining is a, a, a billion dollar industry. Yep. I mean, are we are we over secured? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know, how, how would we decide, right? I mean, and and, and, you, and you know, it's, it's it's really not up to us to decide as we go forward. Uh, you know, will that security decrease, increase? Uh, I don't know. Um, well, I think it, we, we certainly need to we need to keep it as secure as we can, and as you know, as long as we don't. If you, if you create an ultimately secure system that nobody uses, it's useless. So you know, you, there will always be you know, some point where uh, you know, maybe we could do something that makes it more secure, but maybe it will be much less attractive to people. Well, and, and I mean, it, this is a, this is a you know, it's always about discussions. You know, we're trading off this for that. Did you have some thoughts on this, Adam? Do you seem like you wanted to jump yeah, in? <laughs> I mean, the, I think it, it's interesting, Gavin, that you, you made that comment about you could see that, in your view, the, the future would look increasingly data center like. You know, the validation and like, even validation would move into the data center. And well, not necessarily. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a really big technological optimist. Okay. So, uh, you know, I could imagine future smartphones and future software upgrades giving a much higher level of security than we have now um, in a much more decentralized way. And, and I think 
I think we haven't explored all of the ways that you can keep a blockchain secure okay. yet. But let's let's just come back to the short term things. And so you just a few minutes ago said something about you could foresee that you know it would it would over time be the case that more users would be SPV, that those would be specialized and more run by businesses, and that the trend of people you know, even small businesses not running full nodes. Um, so you express some doubt about that, and so well, and we see that happening right now. Yeah. Um, so, so I mean, I wanted to. So, I was pleased you said that because I want to say some things about that. And so, I think it comes back to the question of what is Bitcoin. So, I think the differentiator of Bitcoin is that it provides policy neutrality and it provides trustlessness, so that you can, you know, have your own private keys and it's bearer, and you don't have to trust anybody. If you run a full node, you you really have this kind of robust. Guarantee you pretty much like holding a brick of gold that you've had professionally assayed or something. And, and does, it, does this kind of get to Nick Sasbo's kind of original Bitgold proposal and and way dies be money and then I mean is this kind of are we talking about how? I mean, I think this, that's this that was evolved. Kind of, um, I mean, it's it's hard to infer a huge amount, but it seemed that probably I would say that Nick Sasbo and. Wade I would agree with this viewpoint because they were uh, sort of decentralized thinking and talking about, you know, contracting with pseudonyms and things like that. But, I mean, I think that the path that Gavin laid out is really the kind of corporatization path that moves um, control of Bitcoin ethos and policy out of the hands of users into companies. And that then invites uh, policy slippage. So, you know, if, if basically over time, you know, if you drew some kind of loose graph over time, the, the uh, economically dependent full nodes are reducing in number and becoming more under corporate control because they're more in data centers. And miners, they, you know, we hope that improves, but whether it does or not, they're, they're quite big right now. And it's much easier to apply policy to people who are running you know, data centers, they've got listed companies, and apparently at the consensus conference uh, yesterday, I wasn't there, but um, somebody told me that Regulators were talking about know your miner, so you know, know your customer, know your miner, and it's kind of a worrying trend, right? Because basically, the way that regulators look at the world is to identify the hierarchy, like who's in charge, and who, where are the kind of influence points. And if you, over time, kind of re-architect the network towards a kind of factory model with a hierarchical center, that presents risks. So I just, I just see it that currently, you know, as Mark Friedenbach has said, the the network is already in a fragile state of decentralization. I disagree with that. I think it's plenty decentralized, um, probably over decentralized for you know resistance to uh, kind of regulatory pressure. And, and, and so, what about an NSL letter on let's say two or three miners? How is that over decentralized? Well. Uh, What's being done to these miners? They're, they're uh, receiving a call order to apply some policy or something. Yeah, like a national security letter, like lava they got or something. Uh, for some American miners, we I mean, have plenty of miners in other countries and other jurisdictions, sure, right? If your sure. transactions don't get confirmed by forty percent of the hash rate, there's still sixty percent of the hash rate that will be happy to confirm your transaction for you. If your transaction can even be identified as you know one of these like transactions that are going to be censored. So, you know, as, as like a practical, you know, how big a risk is it? I just, I don't see it. But I mean, we're also setting up the trajectory, right? So it's not that this is a kind of yeah. one-off change. So if we set up a trajectory that just sees increasing centralization, which is kind of the way you presented it, I mean, doesn't that end up as PayPal 2.0 in a data center and then you don't need to mine anyway? Well... I mean, you could you could paint a Bitcoin if, future that looks like that, right? You could continue mining to create the coins. You could run it create, in the data center. If, if we keep one megabyte blocks, uh, then I see an increasing centralization of kind of participation in the network. Transaction fees are going to go up, right? They have to go up. Uh, mining can't be secure with a one megabyte block with 4,000 transactions unless each transaction has a huge transaction fee on it. It just can't. Be right. When it, well, so then, then right. So then you have fewer people participating directly on the Bitcoin blockchain, and it seems to me that's another form of centralization that I find much more worrying. If the only entities participating are like very high net worth million dollar transaction entities, then you know those are pretty easy to get at and control. Right. Uh, but I mean, I think it's you know we should be trying to. 
uh, scale Bitcoin in, in a safe way. And so I, I don't think anybody is saying keep it at one megabyte. So that's, you know, that's not really discussion. So, discussion. We, just, so we just have a, you know, where's the balance? Right. right. How do we decide the what the balance is? Yes. And so hence the kind of 248 thing because the balance far into the future is hard to predict because, you know, if you go back a few years, you know, uh, apparently Satoshi didn't predict a number of things like mining pools, ASICs kind of, I mean, obviously that's predictable, but like how fast that came on, that was kind of a predictable level of decentralization, reduction, uh, speed of adoption, like the fact that miners went blew through like 130 nanometers. If he had been able to predict all that stuff, he would be an even bigger genius <laughs> than he really was, right? So, so what I mean, that's, that's to say that, you know, what, we shouldn't assume that the next four years won't equally surprise us, right? In, during the next four years, perhaps we'll see nation state players doing Bitcoin mining, or perhaps we'll see, you know, a nation state attack Bitcoin on a policy basis. So I know it's the you know the threat model that or, or a nation state might actually adopt Bitcoin on a policy right, basis that would change the game. For well. example, the Isle of Man has been very friendly to Bitcoin companies, rolling out the red carpet and, and regulation to really encourage the industry to come. So, out. so a friend of mine has been kind of half joking, but apparently there are people interested that Iceland should adopt. Bitcoin is their national currency because you know they have cheap cheap power and everybody's. Uh, I think they're doing the opposite, right? I think Iceland is very anti Bitcoin. Yes, well, the currency controls. Yeah, yeah it's very anti because of, yeah they're worried about using it to get around currency controls. They, they, I mean, they really should use it to pull capital into Iceland. And but I mean, Bitcoin could I, siphon I, it. Yeah, I mean, Iceland is one of the few countries just in a kind of geopolitical balance that managed to um, not socialize the cost of banking failure. They actually, you know, uh, penalized the banks and uh, made the shareholders of the banks threw them in jail. The loss. Threw some actually, of the bankers in jail. Yeah, huh? imprisoned some of the bankers. So it just seems that there's, you know, the democracy in that country. It's a smaller country. Maybe the dynamic is different. But they were able to, you know, uh, respect the interests of the man in the street rather than. And, and Iceland's a small economy as well. Yeah, there are only 300,000 like, Very people large there. in relation to the bank. So that was a, something particular to their environment as well. But, you know, again, I, th I think this is, you know, there's a risk of this kind of corporatization path. So, uh, and one of the worries with that is if it, if it fails to policy failure, it's not clear that uh, there's a way to back out of it, right? So if you get things in a data center, there are forces at large that would like to apply policy to any form of payment. We know this, right? And Bitcoin's differentiator is basically that particular part, that it's policy neutral and it, it must remain policy neutral to be interesting because you know, if you want to run a central central server thing, there are things like that, right? There are competing, not even cryptocurrency things yeah, that can do Yeah, but nobody's that. proposing right, scaling up so quickly that it requires a data center to... Uh, yeah, but doesn't... But, well, it, but you're talking about... It. Like, so if we take the block size from one megabyte to 20 megabytes, or even to eight megabytes, even though it's an 8x increase, it's still a, a block of that size every 10 minutes. So it's going to grow even more exponentially, well, and, right? And the other, there are a whole bunch of software optimizations that are in the, kind of in the queue, in, in the air, being worked on, uh, that mean that transaction volume of eight megabytes worth of transactions every ten minutes um, and would be the would be the kind of flow so that that eight megabytes really is spread out over the time um, over like the ten minute period. over the ten minute period and it's not one big you know block being announced right there are optimized block protocols there's already already Matt Corrallo's uh, optimized relay protocol which I believe most blocks are transmitted in one packet one Ethernet packet, new block announcements go out. Um, and all the miners are using that to, to optimize their orphan rates. Um, so, you know, in those kinds of protocols, there's even, you know, I've done work to kind of research future versions of that that would support much, much, much larger blocks. Um, so I think from a software engineering standpoint, we, we understand how, you know, how we will get over the problem that, that miners are complaining about of, you know, I have high orphan rates for, for large blocks. Um, we will get past that problem, and that just won't be 
part of the argument anymore. Well, and the, so I would say a couple of things about those things. So, so one of them is you can't really rely on the net, uh, on the relay network to make an argument about often. In I mean, there are different types of attacks people can do, but the relay network is very efficient in the best case scenario. But yeah. in, in an attack scenario, it doesn't help at all, in a sense, right? Because people can intentionally create a block with full of non-related transactions if they see yeah, I've lost advantage track of, of doing that. Of, of if that is ever an economically rational attack. Um, uh, I, th- I think it would certainly I mean, I've, amplify I've heard, selfish mining. For yeah, example. and I've heard that you know, selfish mining, it might make selfish mining marginally worse. Um, we're not seeing selfish mining so, anyway, partly because to selfish mining more than 30% of hash power and all the pools are under 20%, it looks like, unless they're doing some secret dark mining. Um, yep. But, you know, we're, we're, we're not seeing any practice on the network. So I, I don't know. I, I, I wonder how much we should really worry about that. Okay. So another, another thing was you mentioned kind of headroom within protocols. So uh, in terms of, you know, further optimizing the base protocols and network protocols and things. So one of them was the the amount of time it takes to sync, join a new node to the network and sync it up. Yeah, I know. I, I know we get it all the time with new users on Armory, and and it's a you know the the size of the blockchain growing, it just is constantly increasing this cost for so new I users. I think there's a presentation on this uh, over the next few days. Um, Patrick Sweetman is going to say something about the analysis of that. But what I wanted to say was about the um, there have been apparently I think four separate periods in history during Bitcoin that. The amount of time it took to sync a block to sync up to the network uh, crept up to 24 hours, and then some big kind of re-architectural in, in, optimizations were made, and it shrunk down to an hour or so. And so we're now on the last one of those, which was the Hedis first kind of major refactor that Peter Wooler did. And uh, what what he's saying is that basically we're out of ideas, like. Uh, the, the list of optimizations for that particular problem are almost all played out. There might be a small factor left. Hmm. But so, I mean, there is, you know, when you're talking about um, bandwidth trends, there's headroom from, you know, technology and physics and stuff. But when you're talking about software, uh, architecture stuff, you know, short of snarks and kind of new, new technologies, you've got a wish list and like apparently some of them were basically at the bottom of the wish list and there isn't much more we can do. So, that kind of creates now a kind of stretching off into the future question about how long it will take to sync a block. Anyway, that's a kind of maybe a secondary question because yeah. you can... I mean, I guess I had a more immediate question for Gavin about just the ripeness of, of the whole debate. Like, I mean, why is this so important right now? We got, we got tons of things on the to-do list, tons of things that, like... You know, as an investor involved with several companies, I mean, like I got, I just, I got a lot of things that I want everybody working on. Like, why, why is this such an important topic, or, or is it even? Well, yeah, I, I say that it's urgent, and I use urgent in the in kind of security terms, right? Security issues can be critical. It means you have to absolutely, positively drop everything you're doing and fix them right now. They can be urgent, which is they need it needs to happen. Uh, right, you don't need to drop everything you're doing right now. Uh, there is time to fix it, but it's it's an issue that definitely needs to be fixed. And I think this is an urgent problem because any fix will take at least six months, probably longer, to actually roll out onto the network and have happen. Um, we've seen consensus. The discussion and consensus process is taking a very long time. People have lots of different ideas on exactly what should be done. Um, and there's so far, I haven't heard a clear consensus on how much is too much, how much is not enough. You know, where's the where's the happy medium that everybody can be can be equally unhappy <laughs> <laughs> um, and come to consensus and and, and move forward. Um, yeah, and but in the meantime, you know, transaction volume is steadily going up and up and up. And and my worry is that is that. There will never be like some critical event where we say, "Okay, now is the time." It'll it'll, it'll just be it's like boiling the, boiling the frog. It's huh? like boiling a frog. Yeah, it's that kind of problem where you know, four years from now, we may look back and say, "Where did all the users go?" 
They went to something that was less expensive. They went to something. Mm, that but was more it, I viral. mean, if they're filling up the block size and paying mining fees, I mean, obviously we've got users and they're finding enough value and usefulness from the protocol that they're that they're well, paying my, my to get included. Be, you know, you hit the one megabyte limit, things start to get unreliable. Uh, transaction fees start to go up. Yeah, and people it, start to go away. And that and that's another that's another point that. Uh, Timo Henke had raised is that we actually, you know, we, we don't even want to be bumping up against that limit of the block. We want to have at least like 10, 20, 30 percent of extra space yeah, in you, the blocks so that we have this excess capacity in case there are big massive spikes that come in. I mean, is is that needed? That is needed. Um, and I mean, blocks are found randomly. If you've used Bitcoin, you know sometimes Oh yeah, sometimes yeah. your transaction takes ten seconds to confirm mm-hmm. because a block happened to be found, you know. And the pull, the pull got lucky, everybody the pull got lucky. Exactly. <laughs> um, and sometimes it takes an hour. Um, and so we have these natural variations where transactions will back up. Um, so we'll never ever get to hundred percent full blocks just because every once in a while, you know, miners will get lucky and find six blocks in six minutes, and that will just clear out all the transactions. Boom, 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 boom. So you were talking about it taking quite a while to arrive at consensus. So in, in terms of the technical community arriving at a, a single proposal or compromise or a plan for some period of time, you know, two years, four years, 20 years, whatever that might be. So um, I guess there are something like six main proposals, maybe a few extras, so, yeah, and I wanted it, to push on you about that because I'm curious. You've got a bunch of individuals at Blockstream. Uh, I think there have been two, there'll probably be three proposals coming out of Blockstream for how to address this problem. If you can't even get consensus inside Blockstream, how do we get consensus in the <laughs> wider community? So, uh, I mean, Blockstream hired a bunch of people who were working on core, and yeah. this is also true for yourself and Jeff, for example, right? Yeah. So, Blockstream is not an entity that's, you know, trying to control or take a position in this. So, I think that's to be expected. Um, but in terms of the technical community reaching a consensus on a protocol, you want to keep it kind of cordial and professional and work together, and that's partly what these workshops are about. But so I, I just wanted to put it to you or kind of push back on the idea of uh, going a step further and developing one of them and then encouraging people to use it. You know, so you talk to companies, you encourage it to encourage them to use it, yeah, and but, then you have XT running in the network and people are starting to mine well, it. And that, that comes out of my experience of trying to get the developers. It's like hurting cats, right? <laughs> I've said, you know, get 10 developers in a room, ask them to solve this problem, you'll wind up with 11 different solutions. I think that's probably actually an underestimate. I think you'd wind up with 20. <laughs> um, Seeing that one. And cool. so, I mean, it, it comes down to, you know, a governance question of how, how do you get these cats to agree? And the only, the only solution, the only kind of you know, way forward I saw is to actually release some code and then encourage people to vote with their feet and run the code. Because that is what Bitcoin consensus is, is, is you know, what code are people running? I don't agree, really. I mean, I think that the, I mean, it's, it's the code that people are running, but I think the network can't support, like, the consensus algorithm can't support computing consensus algorithms bouncing around in the network. Like, if you want to do a hot fork upgrade to Bitcoin, you don't want to have like some kind of uh, network war going on. You want everybody to agree on what the mechanism is and upgrade to it in a, in a calm, like sensible way at the same time. So again, I mean, I think the concern I have is that it was perceived, like whether by intent or not, as a you know as as a non-constructive step to deploy it into the network. You know, I mean, does that mean that people should? pay more attention to BIP 101 versus BIP 100. I mean, I know miners picked that up, but I don't think Jeff encouraged them to particularly. I wouldn't know. But, I mean, there are some other proposals, for example, like 103 or FlexCap. uh, Yeah, the deployment for BIP 101, the plan was always to go to merchants, exchanges. Uh, There seems to be reasonably broad consensus among the user community when I say reasonably broad, I mean, if you look at, like, polls on back when I was proposing 20 megabyte blocks, uh, you know, 
informal polls on Bitcoin Talk or on the Reddit showed that you know a super majority of users seemed to think that it was a reasonable idea. Um, but then to go to merchants, and that's why you saw this you know, letter from some of the big merchants um, and exchanges saying, you know, we like BIP 101, we're going to support uh, bigger blocks. Um, and that's the, I think that's the, that's the order of, of the order that things need to proceed in. Um, I was very surprised that I couldn't get consensus among the developer community. Um, and, and I mean, it was a question of, you know, do, do, do the developers like matter for this decision, right? I mean, how much should their opinion be weighed? I mean, certainly, you know, technical opinions about attacks and vulnerabilities we need to listen really carefully to. Um, but that can always be taken too far, right? You can you can always imagine some weird space aliens come down and, and attack something that, you know, it just isn't going to happen. Um, but I don't know. That's something I've been thinking about recently is, you know, what is the role of the people who, who work on the code? They, they, they know a lot about code. Sometimes I think they don't know a whole lot about economics. Sometimes I think maybe they misjudge what businesses want, maybe what miners want. Um, I don't know. I'm mean, curious to hear your thoughts on you know, what you see the role of. Just a little editorial note, a little bit later at dinner, uh, we were all discussing, and Gavin said he didn't really mean exactly what he said a little bit later here, so don't give him too much grief, but we did think that the overall section uh, was good to keep included. Thanks. The developers in this whole consensus building process. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we got to build stuff that people are willing to pay for, you know, that consumers are willing to use, that investors are willing to buy uh, and speculate and hold on. I mean, if I'm being snarky, and I don't mean snark in the... Mm -hmm. If I'm being (laughs) snarky, right, I mean, if the current set of developers can't create a secure Bitcoin network that can handle the equivalent of, you know, four average web pages every 10 minutes, then maybe they should be fired. Right? Uh, I mean, that's kind of the, yeah. Whoa, whoa, take it easy there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, but I mean, that's a, that, that does raise a good point because, you know, Blockstream's raised $21 million. Money follows management. They've raised a lot of money to, to build out and develop this. And who else has raised money to work on the core protocol? You know, we got a lot of these users that are using the core protocol, but how much code are they writing? And how, I mean... How, how much, how much, uh, what is a chronic how, how, how many salaries are they paying yep. to get this code writing? Or are they just free writing off of the work that's uh, being done by, you know, Blockstream or, or some source, of the other ones? All open source software projects. We saw this with OpenSSL, right? Which was, you know, horrifically underfunded and it's probably still. And had a massive underfunded. security vulnerability. And had a massive security vulnerability, sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like, I mean, money follows management. I think it's a great, yeah. It, I think it's a very valid point. Like, you know, we need we need accountability and responsibility and people building stuff that the users, the investors want to use. Um, but you also, like, this stuff doesn't, and we've been talking about it, it's very complicated work, it's very complex, and it doesn't just write itself. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, who's going to pay developers to get this stuff written? So, I mean, I think it's, like, maybe significantly unfair to say that the developer should be fired or something because basically the network would have broken multiple times if you no, I, like tens I of thousands of hours. And, and, well, and, and, they, and that they, really is unfair. Of me and, the, and the market hasn't fired him. In fact, the market's given him you know, $21 million of funding to build out the right. core stuff. So, I mean, the market's voted. The, like, there's the scoreboard, $21 million bucks. Well, yeah. and, like, and, apart you know, from the, that, I mean, I just thought, think that, you know, it's um, it's a complicated area. So... It's maybe not the most productive thing. You know, if you think about Bitcoin as something like the digital signature standard or the open SSL, like the SSL protocol or something, you know, consensus rules are complicated. It took the technical community quite a while to digest the implications of the selfish mining paper. And people were coming out with all kinds of counter proposals of like, well, maybe we can fix it like this, or maybe it isn't really an issue. And I'm not sure that we have a full understanding of the implications today. So I don't think we can just, you know, turn around and give users a political vote as if it's a free parameter, right? I mean, it's maybe like in SSL saying, you know, in the early days, encryption was computationally expensive. So if you turn around to the users and say, like, do you want to 
like complain about 128 bit keys and say we want to chop them in half to 64 and see if you can get like a popular vote on that. Maybe you could have succeeded, but it wouldn't have been an appropriate way to do protocol design. So, you know, without being elitist, I think it's, you know, the implications for decentralization and policy and the risks of getting into a kind of corporatist race where all of that ends up in a data center and there are, you know, policy attacks that happen on it that we can't undo. Um, I think that's a serious thing because that's, that's basically the reason for existence for Bitcoin or Bitcoin becomes a poor imitation of its former self if it ends up as PayPal 2.0 and it's all centralized. And I think it's naive to expect that policy won't creep in if there are policy points because, you know, we've, we haven't seen well, a lot of kind of high they've impact. They've already things. crept in, right? The exchanges are a huge oh, yeah. policy point that are being watched that are reporting that are oh, well they're, they're, you're going to be compliant or you're going to go to jail yeah like charlie shrimp yep exactly. i mean it's that simple it is that simple right but so i mean the the way that the exchanges work is that it acts like a cash rail so the exchanges act as the people depositing and withdrawing cash so in, in banking terms you know if you deposit a large amount of cash you have to report that you have to make suspicious activity reports and so you see that mirrored in the exchanges but you know we do want bitcoin itself to act as the gold bar and, you know, for payment policy neutrality to persist for the long term, because I think it's unrealistic in a global arena to expect, you know, if too much policy creeps into it, you break fundability when, or when it's just awesome. simply cut, cut, you know, send money anymore, which is the current problem today with the existing banking network. That as, you, as you cross national borders, it becomes you know, more expensive or difficult to even route money to certain places. Yeah, so, you and get- so Bitcoin offers the, you know, finally the possibility of a neutral level playing field. So I, I just think that, you know, it's, it's being too populist to turn to people who frankly don't understand the implications. Like some people might find that elitist, but I disagree. It's just very, very complicated. The people writing the code trying to understand these things, it's, it's bleeding edge stuff, right? So it's not like a free parameter that we can just tinker with. And the network is already quite centralized. Uh, I, I share Mark Friedenbach's view and the, the kind of balance between uh, miners, you know, miners running full nodes and full nodes, economically dependent full nodes, doing the auditing, you need one or the other of those to be strong, right? So we've already got the mining at a weak place, so we certainly don't want to stress it further and weaken the full node auditors. So if the, the kind of uh, bit fury statistics are showing that as you increase the block size, you know, it, it will push people off the network and people's network connections are not just dedicated all day long to run, you know, Bitcoin. They have to exist with VoIP and YouTube streaming and kids playing games and stuff. And if it starts to be inconvenient or it pushes their bandwidth cap and they get like, you know... So uh, it's, it's an empirical question, right? I mean, you're okay with 248. I would like to see 816, 32, 64. Uh, up to eight gigs, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, in twenty years, when you know yeah. we're all running. IPhone yeah, if we've 11s. got the bandwidth and the hardware that can support something. Like yeah, and that. if miners choose to create block stack, big, right? Yeah, I mean, part of the reason why I think actually eliminating the block size is because miners will not create block stack big unless they can handle the bandwidth and transactions worldwide. So, so. Also, also, you expressed surprise that the developers didn't uh, immediately go along with the proposal, but I think. But I was surprised that they didn't see it as a priority. Right? So back in January, I started pushing privately. Come on, back in the well. Well, I mean, this in but, Puerto Rico, you saw. But this is this has been an issue for how many years? It's been I mean, an issue for re- really, years. we've been talking about this for years. I mean, e- even when it even when the discussion happened uh, to put the block size cap in there in the first place, I mean, there was discussion. Yeah. That, oh, this is going to create a, a cap fight later on. <laughs> So here we are. <laughs> here we are. I, well, I mean, the good news is I think everybody thinks it is a priority now. We are talking about it. We're, um, we're definitely putting forth some massive brain power. Yes, absolutely. I mean, as, an, as kind of an investor, you know, I, I'm obviously going to look to the subject matter experts like you two and, and lots of our other uh, brilliant minds in the area. Uh, but, you know, I also kind of look at, I, I want to step back and look at the larger picture. You know, we're, we have a symphony going on and it's almost like this discussion has become one key on the piano that's just getting banged over and over and over and over again and now everybody's just so frustrated with it (laughs) like we've almost 
broken the key, you know, with censorship on, on the subreddit, the fracturing in the community. Now it's spilling over into the mainstream press. Uh, that shaking confidence, people are laughing, <laughs> laughing at us and the way we, we think we're getting stuff done. It's, I, I wonder if it's like in, impeded or, or stopped even some uh, investment funding rounds, you know, because it's shaking confidence in, in the community and like faith in some of the stuff that's happening. And, and, and we're talking about people's livelihoods here, you know, like whether, whether people, whether there's still going to be a job there for people or not, or whether these startups will actually get created or not. So, I mean, it's a, it is definitely a very serious, serious topic and, and I don't know that it's easily resolved. You know, obviously we've, yeah, that, we've been fine about the, it for a long time. It's a tricky thing. I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't see an easy way to resolve it. Um, there's no one person who's going to make the decision. Um, you know, whatever happens, I just, I don't know, maybe after the, the conclusion of this workshop, I'll, I'll drive home the big smile on my face and, and <laughs> feel confident that, you know, we will have some reasonable compromise that everybody will be happy with. Um, but so, know, that's, I mean, that's my hope. In normal <laughs> political situations, to, to arrive at a conclusion, you have to be at the table, right? So you, you have a bunch of people all negotiating around the table. In some places, they get to kind of political situations where they're not even talking yeah, to each other you, and then they have talks about talks. You just kind of said that a bunch of people you don't want to be at the negotiating table though because they don't really understand the issues deeply enough. No, no, right? but I mean, I, w- I was referring to the... Yeah, so I mean, if, if you've got a contentious technical topic, I don't think it really helps the topic to turn technical parameters over to the public to vote on them. But just in terms of getting the technical folks to agree on a proposal, which seems like the first step to me, you know, as, as Trace said, now we have, you know, Bitcoin company representatives talking in the media and saying different things or signing conflicting letters or mining different versions, incompatible things in the network, which is not a good idea, in my opinion. You know, if you want, if you want a technical community to, to reach a consensus, the technical community have to be around the table. And I feel that, you know, potentially XT has walked away from the table. Start a new table. Oh, I, I would. I mean, <laughs> but Gavin's here, like talking on the podcast. Is here, you know, participating in the debate. Uh, he's at the scaling Bitcoin workshop. Um, oh, fair enough. I mean, it, 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 and and you know, Bitcoin XT is mine. What one block out of the last thousand? So I mean, it, it's not like it's gotten huge uptake or or. Well, been causing I, I, much I think, problem for the, yeah, for the I, actual network. I think that it's a mistake to think about it as a minor popularity because... Yeah, that, I agree with that. I mean, you know, actually... I mean, that's, yeah, you know, and I, it's got like 12% of I've the nodes or something like zero that. Zero lobbying of miners, right? I want to talk to exchanges, merchants, users, uh-huh. right? Get the economic majority agreeing this is a reasonable thing to do. And then it's time to go to the miners and say, the economic majority thinks this is the right way to go. Um, then try to get miners on board. So I agree with those two steps, but I think we missed the first step, which is getting the technical community to agree on some parameters. Because by skipping over that step, it yeah, antagonizes I the just, technical community, I surely, right? Yeah, I I mean, we talked about this before you released X2. You're right, and it might have been a mistake. But I just didn't see any... From, from where I sit, you know, I, I heard a clear chorus... <laughs> clear symphony <laughs> from all of the, the merchants, like, exchanges, users, even the miners, that we want bigger blocks. Um, but I don't hear that same symphony for exactly how to accomplish that among the technical community. And frankly, I don't... Well, because it's a hard problem to solve. Well, I think, it's, like. I think it's an easy problem to solve. It's just there are multiple possible solutions and there's no clear way to decide which one is best. And so, you know, you get engineers arguing about it and they'll never agree yeah so what do you do so they talk about it right and nothing gets done <laughs> well okay I mean so, so maybe, there, needs to, there needs to be a deadline there needs to be some process for some good decision I mean maybe the way to look at it is things are where they are and look at it as water under the bridge and say okay now we have a bunch of proposals yeah what should we do so I, I chucked one over the over the wall, like how about two four eight, which is you know not my idealized parameters personally, but just something that respects so and pays attention can, to figures in the you network. If you can get everybody at Blockstream to agree to that, if you can get consensus there, then I think that would be like a good like 
straw poll of like developer consensus, right? I mean, if you you guys, I assume you communicate all the time, uh, like closely, you know each other, you like each other, right? If if you know you could get those cats herded, uh, then I think I'm maybe I'd be more optimistic that you know the wider development community could come to consensus. So I mean, Jeff Jeff Garzik had a, a similar proposal like Bit One or Two. Uh, which is just a straight two megabyte, and I think that's that's kind of too short term. I think two four eight. I think better. everybody hates that. I think. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I, I talked about it with him in terms of comparing two four eight to two, and he's saying, well, yeah, two was my proposal to do something like that, but I think two four eight is okay. It's it lasts a bit longer. It shows it shows some growth, and it creates some time to do work on more complicated things. Like we haven't lightning talked network, about lightning at all, you know, right? lightning so, network, and so hopefully within four years we could see the effects of some of those things. Like, find out, do they work as we expected? What's the rate of recirculation, which is kind of how efficient yeah. it is? I mean, theoretically, it looks like it should work. The base technology we know works because it's going way back to the... Like, in practice, if people are only doing two recirculates, then it's actually a net negative. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, there's all these... Right. So, so, but I mean, you know, people are, like, there are, I guess, three, maybe four companies working on it right now, mm-hmm. multiple yeah. alpha implementations. So, People are pretty excited and working hard on it. And Lightning's really exciting, right? If, if, actually, if I was a VC or investor, I'd take a look at Lightning and uh, I'd be really excited. Yeah, I mean, I actually ran into uh, both Joseph and Thaddeus yesterday at the consensus. And I was like, i got to interview you guys for the podcast because everybody is just ranting and raving about it's very, Lightning. It's very, 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 very insanely cool. Uh, we'll solve a whole bunch of problems if it actually so, so, I mean, that's, works and yeah. it doesn't violate the keep it simple, stupid <laughs> too much, right? It is more complicated. Yeah, I mean, um, Bitcoin is complicated. Sometimes we have to suck it up and make the magic work yeah, so that true. it's as long as this interface is simple, people don't care. I mean, yeah. they push the bar on all kinds of complicated machines today and have no idea how they work. So, well, but security wise, right? I mean, yeah, I agree. It's better. So, there are mm-hmm. all sorts of, I'm, I'm sure there'll be edge cases in right. Lightning that are <laughs> uncomfortable and sharp. Uh, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, we really, we got to get to dinner. <laughs> we, we've gone way over our time. But, uh, I, you know, I'd just like to thank the two of you, you know, absolute legends in the Bitcoin space, uh, showing us how to, how to have a civil, professional discussion on tough topics. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. We've had uh, Gavin Andreessen and uh, Dr. Adam back. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Trace. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise, spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate.